Good evening. I got really excited sitting in the back. I thought y'all were celebrating the youth minister finally filling in to preach because it said shining star. And then, I, and then I moved up to the front and I saw the plural S and I, I got a little disappointed and realized that was not about me. So if you're visiting, um, I'm Blake Dozier. I'm the youth and family minister here and I'm filling in for Chris who is speaking in Oklahoma this evening and he'll be back with us next week. Um, but I do want to take a few minutes before I start speaking, um, or before I get into the lesson, to talk a little bit about shining stars. Um, if you are one of our shining stars, would you raise your hand high? We got a lot of them scattered out in the audience. A lot of them were up here at Pew Packers. Hey, we want y'all to know how proud we are of you. Y'all are a big deal to us here at Oldham Lane. You have excellent Bible class teachers. You have excellent parents, but you come to class and you listen to what your teachers teach. And we're so proud of the things that you've learned over this last year. And we're excited to celebrate that with you tonight. So if you are, if you are a grown-up in the audience, um, immediately after the evening service, it will be here in the auditorium. We're going to let our kids come up and we're going to have our Shining Stars program where we celebrate everything they've learned over the last year. And we hope that you will stay and show your support for them in that. After that, we'll have a fellowship meal next door, and you're invited to that as well. I'm going to begin my lesson this story with a story, like a, or my lesson this evening with a story like I usually do. This one is a little different. Um, right after I had graduated from college, I got the opportunity to spend six weeks in Guatemala with a program called the Medical Evangelism Training Program, it was for pre-med students, which I was at the time. Um, this program was associated with Health Talents International. Um, I know the Howlers and the Stanleys are pretty involved with them, and I think we may have some others here. And part of this six-week training program, the very first week was a required spell in language school so that we could learn Spanish. Turns out I hadn't paid very close attention in my high school Spanish class. My... Uh, I, I knew like hola, bueno, and ombligo, which meant belly button. Because that's the thing that, you know, high school guys think is funny. So here I am, um, a week in language school, kind of excited about that until I find out that this group of 10 or 12 of us is getting split up, and we're going to spend the entire week with a family who speaks nothing but Spanish with no English-speaking people in the house. So you can imagine the first conversation that I had with that family was a little bit awkward. Um, there was a lot of smiling and head nodding on my part. So I didn't know anything that they were saying. About five minutes in, I kept her here saying, seis, seis, okay, that, was, that means six. All right, so I got that one. And then later on, she said something about de la mañana, okay, in the morning, six, six in the morning. Well, that sure seemed early, but, but I, I put the pieces together, and I nodded, and she was saying something about 6 in the morning. I didn't know what it was. I agreed to it, and I just decided I was going to wake up the next morning at 6 and see. So I did, and uh, we ate a really nice breakfast, and then me and my host family started walking down the street, and we walked around a couple of corners. We ended up in the town square. To my dismay, we're heading straight for Catholic Mass in Spanish, and I have never been so uncomfortable in my entire life. I had never been to Catholic Mass. <clears throat> I didn't understand what was happening if it was in English, and this one was in Spanish, and there was a lot of standing and kneeling and, and looking at uh, and making hand signals, and I didn't know what any of it was, and I was just trying to blend in, okay, just trying to not stick out my very first day in language school, and this is where I found myself. The foundation wasn't in place for me to understand what was happening. There wasn't a foundation in place for me to understand what I was agreeing to, for me to understand the conversation that had happened between me and the host family. The foundation simply wasn't there. And as we open up our Bibles this evening and we turn to Acts chapter 17, we're going to see Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, and we're going to find that he doesn't preach the gospel the way that he normally does. And the reason was because the crowd that he was speaking to didn't have the foundation in place to understand the way that he normally spoke. Instead, we see Paul 
returning to some foundational truths that we must all understand for the gospel to have any meaning whatsoever. Tonight we're going to talk about the Sermon on Mars Hill. And I'm going to argue that the Sermon on Mars Hill was bad news if you weren't a follower of Christ. But it laid the foundation for people to understand why the good news is good. We're going to look at, we're going to make three observations as we walk through the text. And I'm going to ask you three questions. You're going to see that Paul is repulsed by idolatry. And I'm going to ask you, what's your opinion about idolatry? You're going to see that Paul's worldview was centered on an all-powerful and yet very personal God. And I'm going to ask you how you view God. And then we're going to see that Paul saw the situation as urgent. And I'm going to ask you how you view the situation that we are in right now. So if you'll open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, the Sermon on Mars Hill was given by the Apostle Paul. He was a key figure in spreading the gospel to the non-Jewish community. And in verse 16, we see that Paul finds himself in the city of Athens after being run out of Thessalonica and Berea by some disgruntled Jews who didn't like his teaching. He leaves behind Silas and Timothy, and as he arrives in Athens, he sets up camp. He has instructed them to join him, them, and he waits. But we find that Paul was not a very good waiter. He was a lot better preacher. Let's turn to our text and pick up in verse 16. We read, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. As we move through the text, we're going to see that that his preaching gave him exposure to a group of philosophers. And eventually that ends up with an invitation for him to come share this message in the Areopagus. And that's where the Sermon on Mars Hill comes from. But before we move into that, I want to stop and look what the text says about Paul. Paul was repulsed by idols. The text has nothing good to say about Paul's attitude towards idolatry. It distressed him, and it provoked him to action. What is your attitude towards idolatry in the world around us and in your own life? I believe Paul was disgusted because he knew all too well where idolatry led people. He knew the history of Israel, and he would have been familiar with the words of God in Deuteronomy chapter 32. In verse 21, we read, They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. God goes on to explain in verse 24 that this idolatry would lead his people to bitter destruction, is what the text says. He goes on to describe idolatry as poisonous and destructive and empty. If you turn your Bibles to... uh, I'm sorry, in verse 36 through 37 of Deuteronomy 32, he he sarcastically asks, Where are their gods, the rock in which they sought refuge? Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. In Romans chapter 1, verse 25 through 26, Paul states it similarly. He says, For they exchanged... The truth of God for a lie. And they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. In verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to those things which are not proper. Over and over again, throughout history, throughout the teachings of Paul, we see idolatry is repulsive because it pulls us towards ruin. It pulls us towards degrading passions. Paul knew this. He could see it happening, and it provoked him to teach about the alternative. And so I stop and ask you again, what's your attitude towards idolatry? Do you see the idolatry around us for what it is? People are worshiping money and and things. Houses, cars, our gadgets. We worship relationships. Maybe it's our kids or our spouse or our friends. We worship our social media accounts. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. All of these are 
are very real secondary idols that I believe point us towards the main idol that we worship in our lives, and that's the idol of self. We worship the God of self, and we feed it with social media and debt. It's creating a spiritual cancer that's, that's eating our culture and eating our churches from the inside out. That distresses me, and, and it provokes me. And when you look around and you see that, that it, doesn't, it, doesn't just, it doesn't spare people within the church, when we allow idolatry in, it ruins our lives, and it's no different than what Paul observed in Athens and what was spoken of in Romans and what God describes through Moses in Deuteronomy. And that's why I think that it's important that we stop and we examine the teachings of Paul here in Athens and we go back to the foundational truth, truths taught on March Hill. And he begins by pointing them back to an all-powerful and personal God. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 22, we read. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served with human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Paul's worldview, first of all, was centered around an all-powerful God. And I want to ask you, how do you view him? You know, I think sometimes we can be pretty quick to answer this question because most of us in this room believe in God. But do you believe right things about God? Do you view everything in the world through the lens of an all-powerful and absolute creator? Or do we pay lip service to the idea? We talk about this a lot in the youth class we have lately, but our views on this topic are being subtly or not so subtly undermined by everything that our culture believes is reasonable and logical. Evolution has been provided as an explanation of existence, and it's given those hardened against the truth and out. The supernatural is dismissed as impossible because... Science doesn't give provisions for it. But I want to remind you something this evening because something made everything because something doesn't come from nothing. And that something is an all-powerful and absolute God. And he has no need for you whatsoever. You've got to let that sink in for just a second. Paul said, He does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Once that has sunk in, and only once it has, we start to realize that this all-powerful, this absolute God, has voluntarily placed himself close to us, and he treats us as his children desiring that we would reciprocate that relationship. Turn back to the text, and let's start again in verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and we move and we exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his children. Paul's worldview was also centered on a personal God. What about yours? Do you believe God has positioned himself close to you so that you would find him? Do you believe this all-powerful creator would really desire a relationship with you? Because Paul teaches that he does. You see, you need to know these things, and the world needs to know these things. This is, this is defending our faith 101, and, 
And quite frankly, this attitude is vastly different than the beliefs that we see in our culture. And, and I think if we're really pressed those within the church on some of these thoughts, I'm not sure how many confessing believers really get the magnitude of what Paul is saying. If we turn back to Romans chapter 1, and we start in verse 18, Paul writes here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Creation screams the truth to us, but culture suppresses the truth. Creation points us towards a creator. And culture pushes us towards the creature. The Athenians needed to be reminded of this obvious but foundational truth about God, about his power, about his ultimacy, and yet about his voluntarily close, voluntary closeness. His view of us as children, and to be honest, I think some of us could use a reminder as well. And that brings me to my third and final point. Paul saw the situation as urgent do you judgment is pending paul understood that we would all we will all someday stand before this ultimate absolute and powerful creator that he preaches about we pick up our text in verse 29 being then the children of god we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and thought of man Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. We will stand before him. Our children will stand before him. Our neighbors will stand before him. And he will enact his perfect and complete judgment. He will enact justice. He will right all of the wrong. You know, we have a saying, life's not fair. Someday it will be. Because God will make it so. And that means on that day, on that day, we will answer for our contribution to the brokenness in the world that we see around us. And that's urgent. Hebrews 10.31 may be too all real for many. It says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In 1 Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, we see Paul in context has called their attention to this powerful God, and he says this God spoke the world into existence. Okay, that's similar to what Paul has preached here. And then he tells them that with that same power, with the same power that he used to speak the world into existence, He's going to speak it out of existence. Okay? And, and on that day, his judgment will be unexpected. And it will also be complete. 2 Peter 3.10 reads, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Church, this is serious. It's eternal. And it's urgent. Understanding the concept of judgment is foundational to everything we believe about the purpose of Christ and our need for Christ. We don't know when our lives will end and we don't know when God will return to enact his judgment. But we do know that God's desire is for us to repent and not perish. In fact, if we went back to our text in 2 Peter 3.10, if we backed up just one verse, right before he tells us about the pending judgment and how it will come like a thief in the night, he says this. He says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 
God has provided a way out. Paul tells us in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, as it is the power of God for salvation for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Later on in Romans chapter 6, he says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For us to understand the power of salvation, for us to understand the good news, we must understand the foundational truths that Paul teaches here in the Areopagus. We have to understand the bad news before the good news is really good. We have to understand who God is. We have to understand what God will do. We have to understand the ultimacy and the urgency of the gospel. So I want to ask you my uh, main questions again. Are you distressed over the idolatry in the world around you? Do you really view God as the all-powerful and absolute creator of the universe? Do you really view God as close and personal? Do you feel the urgency of pending judgment? Some of you tonight are, are where you need to be, and I understand that. I hope this lesson for you was a reminder about where others are so that we might help them see the truth. Some of you think you are where you need to be, and you're not. You can spend a lifetime giving lip service to God while worshiping your very own personal idols. And my call tonight to you is the same call that Paul gave. This is urgent. Wake up and repent. Some of you simply aren't following Christ, and either you haven't known or you haven't done anything about it. And for you, the message today and quite frankly, the words of Paul are bad news. That said, if you understand the content of the message, then the foundation has been laid so that you can understand why the good news is so good. Why it's the best news that you can receive. And, and we as a church would love to share that story with you. We would love to share with you what the story looks like. While the literal gospel, the literal good news isn't proclaimed by Paul in the Sermon on Mark. Hill. He proclaims it numerous times elsewhere, and here it is in a nutshell. You don't have to shoulder the judgment of God that you deserve. Jesus has offered himself in your place. Turn from your selfish ways, repent. Attach yourself to Christ in baptism, and God will extend to you his perfect and complete grace, his salvation. The matter is urgent. We are not promised tomorrow. Come forward as we stand and sing.